Today, the NASDAQ just officially went into another bull market, meaning the NASDAQ is now up 20% from the lows. And this has a lot of people feeling a certain kind of way towards technology. On one hand, some people think technology is a safe haven during a recession. Other people think technology has been under-owned for the past year and a half and think there's still more upside from here. Now, at the same time as all of this, people are disregarding the banking crisis. They are disregarding the fact that inflation is still 6%, and they are disregarding the red warning signs that are flashing in this market. Now, are these things going to crumble tomorrow? Maybe. We have some important economic data coming out tomorrow on inflation, which could start the domino effect. But I'm not expecting it to. We typically get massive rallies in equities before the crashes ultimately come. Think 2007. Think the crash of 2018. The crash of 2019. The crash of 2020. All of these instances. You've seen very aggressive rallies right before the crash actually happened. And that's why I think we are closer than ever to actually getting this stock market crash. So here in this video, this is a video for really all of my investors out there slash traders that want to try to make a lot of money off of this next downturn. I, th I think people are getting a little bit too excited here when the pain is really ahead of us as far as economically speaking. And this video may help you profit on uh, some of that potential pain and maybe give you a glimpse of the timeline on when this pain could come. So we're going to focus on the short term events here in this video. The economic data coming out tomorrow, the next Fed meeting, really the short term, but also take a focus on the next couple of months and the overall earnings picture for 2023 on when this crash could ultimately play out and 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 kind of what i'm looking at guys so let's get into it uh hit the like button if you guys find some useful information out of these this video and if you want more videos like this let me know in the comment section so let me just start with this fun fact the s p 500 the top 500 companies in the United States. If you took out the top six companies that we're going to look at here in just a second, the S&P 500 was actually negative in the first three months of 2023. If you include those companies in the S&P 500 and it you incorporate all of the companies, right? All 500 companies. The S&P is up a little bit over 3%, almost 4% for Q1 2023. So what's really the top five to 10 largest companies in the S&P that are carrying all the, all of the weight and they're, that are really packing the punch. And as of recently, the breadth of this rally has not been very good, meaning the 490 or so companies in the S&P have not really been doing all too well, but the top 10 have been really outperforming. Now, a lot of this is seen as a rush to safety due to the collapse of SVB, which the S&P 500 is now up almost 6% from those lows after the banking crisis, yet that situation is very much far from over but i think that is the least of our concerns that we're going to have heading throughout the rest of 2023 now it's very hard to forecast if another bank will go bankrupt or what the implications will be from these banks that have went bankrupt number one i'm sure you guys have heard already but when banks fail other banks they stop lending as much. They stop giving you that extended line of credit. They stop giving you mortgages on homes that they otherwise would have. Maybe these are very large homes or they don't really want to refinance that new office building that you just purchased or built a couple of years ago. Those things help to contribute to a lower GDP and an overall consumer slowdown. And that's the risk with the banking crisis 
ultimately, because let's be clear, your JP Morgans, your Goldman Sachs, your Bank of America, your Cities, your Wells, they're not going to go under. They're probably going to benefit when all things are said and done due to this banking crisis. And before this banking crisis happened, the Fed was going to raise rates more aggressively. That is because inflation remains stubbornly high. And currently, since the banking crisis, the markets are now expecting up to four rate cuts by the end of 2023. And it's hard to imagine that that is not part in part or a huge reason why some of your largest companies in the S&P 500, as well as the NASDAQ, your top dogs, have been rallying. I think that would be ignorant to say that has nothing to do with it. Is that realistic? <laughs> no, we're not going to get rate cuts in 2023. But if we did, it's because the economy is so bad, you probably don't want to own stocks to begin with. Or a reason why we could get huge rate cuts by the end of 2023 would be if inflation just falls off of a cliff goes back down to around three percent i could see that scenario being that the fed would then start to dramatically cut interest rates but until that happens we're not getting cuts now that is why tomorrow's economic data is going to be massively important for this market you are going to get core pce which for the month of january came in at 0.6 percent you are expecting a 0.4 percent reading for the month of february that is still far higher than the fed's two percent inflation target and that's going to push against this whole rate cut theory now that's not it earnings earnings will be starting here very shortly for q1 of 2023 earnings expectations are still very very high they're across the board some people expect the s p 500 to earn about 230 dollars for 2023 some firms like morgan stanley are expecting the s p to get about 195 dollars of earnings for 2023 now if we go ahead and pull up the calculator i know we all hate math so we're gonna be brief with this well if the markets are currently trading at 403 what's the multiple on this where should the markets be trading at based off of actual earnings and, and when do those earnings start to matter well let's let's just say the s p does about $215 of earnings for 2023. It's not Morgan Stanley's low estimate. It's not the highest estimate. It's kind of in the middle. And I think this is where more so average uh, people are expecting the S&P earnings to be. Well, the way that you figure this out is you times 215 by your PE multiples. So you do 215 times, let's call it a very good market comparable to 2021 let's do a 20 times pe multiple that's putting the s p at 430 dollars or the spy the etf that tracks the s p 500 you put that at a 20 times multiple you're at 430 well if you do 215 times a recessionary kind of multiple which the average consensus view is that we are going into recession in the second half of 2023 and you put a 16 times pe ratio on this market you're sitting at 344 on the spy that is a very big difference from here and that is why there is so much volatility and uncertainty in this market that we are in right now and that's why people are willing to pay 27 times forward earnings for something like apple a very much mature company one it's got a decent level of stability a lot of cash in the bank right there's reasons to want to own these companies but not if earnings are going to go down and that's why this upcoming earnings season is going to be vitally important for this market as well as the course of inflation and that's why the pce data coming out tomorrow will also be super super important but what are 
some of the kind of red flags that I'm seeing here in the markets. And this is really based off of historical um, price action, I guess you could call it, in the S&P 500. And I want to take you back to uh, really 2007 and, and kind of break down what happened during this moment in time because it's very reminiscent of what we are seeing now and i know we got to go back quite a bit uh we're almost there 2010 okay we're in 2007 and actually it is 2008 that we were looking for on march 16th bear stearns went belly up that was right here that was on a sunday and the markets dropped a little bit, then the markets rallied when we thought a bailout was coming, right? You kind of went higher from there. You hit a new high, at least in relative in this relative time frame, right? You hit that new high by May. And then you started to come down a little bit. And then what happened? On September 15th, Lehman Brothers went belly up. And then the pain really came. And that's when the crash came. It wasn't until months and months later. And I think that could be eerily reminiscent to what we're seeing now. Well, let's fast forward to more recent history. And talk about the, the 2018 crash, right? What'd you get right here? 2018 crash. You crashed, but you actually rallied right before the crash in a two-month period about seven percent okay and then you crashed well what happened in the end of 2018 same thing you crashed you rally back up and you crashed again what happened right before covid really from 2019 from october until february or march of 2020 you actually rallied from this baseline to the peak, almost 15%, and then you crashed. Well, what are we seeing right now? You're getting this very bullish push in the markets. And this is the big reason why I think this might last a while. I, I, I think you could actually hit maybe 430, 440 on the S&P 500. You could really get an exuberant rally here. People disregarding fundamentals. And then you could set yourself up for that bigger crash. And the reason I personally believe this, this happens the way that it happens, that you usually rally hard into a crash, is because of the trading algorithms. Now, I think if the markets are so bearish that everyone thinks a crash is coming, well, you can't have everyone buying puts and buying insurance, then a crash happens, because... I mean, you just can't have that many winners, right? That's not how the system works. But if people feel really bullish and then shit hits the fan, it's a little bit easier for market makers and algos to deal with that, right? When there's not as many people that are bearish and have puts and downside protection. So I think over the next couple of months here, obviously inflation data is going to be very important. Earnings are also going to be super, super important, especially at your large tech. If large tech earnings do not hold up, that's going to be a very, very big problem. If this earnings season shows that tech's doing fine, well, that could delay a crash a lot further and really could be towards the end of 2023 but all in all it looks like things are going to get at least more bullish before they get worse as far as what history has ultimately shown us now you are seeing for mar for may 3rd the markets are currently expecting the fed to pause with a 54.1% probability. 45.9% of investors do expect another 25 basis point rate hike. And that's kind of what Fed members have been saying is you're going to get a 20, 25 basis point rate hike. And, and that's why this data coming out tomorrow, the PCE, as well as other data points in regards to inflation are going to be so important from now until may but even after then because it's going to dictate what the fed can ultimately do and the 
longer this banking crisis lasts, if more banks start to go under, well, that's going to give the markets a little bit more cushion pricing in these, these rate cuts. Ultimately, when this recession comes because earnings go down exponentially, I'm in the camp of earnings are, are going to fall by quite a bit in 2023. That's when the real crash does happen, but we're probably months away from actually seeing that happen unless Q1 earnings are terrible or unless inflation ramps up in a way that we are not expecting, then you're going to be okay for a while. This is really the time that you should prepare for this upcoming crash. This is the time to be acquiring as many dollars as you can possibly get your hands on and be ready to buy the dip. And if you find deals along the way, by all means, feel free to buy those as well, not financial advice, but the crash is coming. And another major data point that points directly to this is the yield curve inversion. Now, it's not the inversion that is painful, it's the uninversion because a yield curve inversion means a two-year bond, we're looking at the two and 10-year spread right now, a two-year bond pays you out more than a 10-year bond, right? Pretty simple there. We understand that. Let's call it a two-year bond pays you out 4% and a 10-year bond pays you out 3%. Well, two-year pays you out 1% more, you're inverted 100 basis points, 1%. Well, Okay, that's fine. That's because the markets expect in the near term, the Fed's going to be raising rates. Inflation's going to be higher over the next two years. You need to see the bond yields high in two years. And by 10 years down the line, the Fed's going to cut rates. Inflation should be lower. Makes sense. At least it should to everyone that's been in the markets for a while. Well, when inflation is 6%, and the two-year bond starts to fall and inevitably become a smaller yield or a lower yield than the 10-year bond, well, that's telling you that either massive deflation is coming, a crash is coming, or inflation is about to plummet and the Fed will be able to cut interest rates. So I think that is really, this is a very bad sign that you were inverted by a hundred basis points, 110 basis points. And now the, now you're only inverted by about half that. So if this inversion continues to uninvert, that is the number one thing that I think every one of you guys should be paying attention to. If you're looking forward to some kind of stock market crash, if you're looking to kind of play that arbitrage trade, if everyone gets more bullish, that's where you want to get a little bit more defensive. So right here and right now, that's exactly what I'm doing. Accumulating as many dollars as possible to get ready to buy the living crap out of this dip when it does ultimately come. And now there's a lot of other factors that are uh, showing that the stock market is probably getting overextended here. Just look at the tech stocks that are controlling the markets and the rest of the market. Rest of the market's not doing so hot, whereas Tesla's up over 100% from its lows. Apple is up 35% from its lows. NVIDIA up over 135% from the lows. Look at Facebook up over 100% from its lows. That, that story is not universal to the broad markets. Most stocks that got beat down in 2022 are still beat down. It's all residing in your large mega tech kind of companies. And that's the danger here. So that is going to do it for this video. Hit that like button, subscribe to the channel, source your comments, questions, or concerns down below in the comment section. And if you guys want to come trade with me live in real time, link down below in the description of this video. If you don't have time to monitor these things for yourselves, but you potentially want to get in on a stock market crash, on the profits that could come with that, link down below in the description is your place to do it. I will keep you guys informed of anything that I am seeing in real time when it does happen. That is it. You guys enjoy the rest of your day, and I will see you in the next one.